with retired British Army officer Colonel Richard Kemp, who can join me now. Welcome to the programme. Let's um, first talk about the more erratic behaviour of Russian troops in the last day or so. The, the, the less uh, discriminatory uh, form of attack, the indiscriminate nature of it. Does this show a Russian army that is flailing? I don't think it does. I think what it shows is a Russian army that is willing to unleash whatever level of violence it needs to achieve its objectives. And that would include in, in, you know, hitting targets that have civilians inside them. We don't know whether they're deliberately targeting civilians or they just happen to be killing civilians where there is a military position. That's something I don't think anyone knows at the moment. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk about how the Russian army is failing. The way I see it, the Russian army never set out to overwhelm Ukraine immediately. I don't think that was their objective. They probably knew they couldn't do that. So they started off slowly um, with relatively limited force and carefully targeted force in order to to bring Ukraine to, uh, to the to negotiations and to get them to come to terms with Russia. That doesn't appear to have worked. And so now, if uh, if the Russian, if the Ukrainian army won't surrender in the face of the overwhelming force that's been built up, it will be used against them. I've no doubt whatsoever in the coming days. The, the Ukrainian army have fought extremely hard, but the Russian army is a massive and overwhelming force. <clears throat> is there a worry that we in the West and potentially us in in Britain in particular have been leaning too much into trying to present the situation as rosier? than it actually is. Speaking about how the Russian advance is slowing, how Putin wanted to take the whole country in, in a day or two, and that's not worked. Uh, are, are, we, are we kidding ourselves here? We are. And I think um, it's not only, uh, you know, the fact that we are willing, trying to will the Ukrainians to win. And to be honest, who wouldn't? Mm. Um, but we're, we are, to an extent, I think, ignoring the hard reality uh, and we're also forgetting history. I mean, let's not forget that in 2003, um, it took a, a much larger US-led coalition over a month to overwhelm Saddam Hussein. Uh, and it took over six days in that period to capture the capital city, Baghdad. So, you know, anyone who expected an immediate conquest of Ukraine by Russia was, I think, mistaken. Uh, I th and and the, you know, the, the, the other issue, of course, is um, that uh, both sides will be issuing propaganda. And I think, you know, the fact that Ukraine might say that X number of Russian aircraft have been shot down, that might be true, but I don't think we can assume it is. I think we have to take it with a pinch of salt. And that's partly because uh, the, the situation on any battlefield is always confused. And the reports you get very rarely turn out to be accurate when they're properly uh, assessed. Now, the Ministry of Defence this morning has said that Russia has failed to gain air superiority over Ukraine. I, I suppose we can take the specific statements of our own Ministry of Defence as being true. Uh, and to that extent, has Ukraine offered a greater level of resistance than perhaps Putin was expecting or hoping for? Uh, and that's aside the issue that this, uh, this is a, a war that will likely be won by the Russians. Well, I hope I hope I'm wrong in in that in that assessment that the Russians are going to win, but I fear I might be right. Mm. Um, I think uh, the, in terms of um, Putin's assessment of the Ukrainian army or armed forces, I, I doubt he underestimated them. I, I think that's unlikely. He's got a very effective military intelligence service who have been following and monitoring the Ukrainian forces for a long time. They know that they've been heavily trained, highly trained by. Britain, America, other uh, Western allies, and equipped very well. I mean, America could put in $2.5 billion of military aid to Ukraine since 2014. We've also contributed a great deal ourselves. So I, I, I don't think they will have been underestimated. Um, I, think, I think the reality is Putin never planned this to be a lightning operation. Uh, he was always going to take his time. He doesn't want to inflict massive casualties on the Ukrainian people not because he's a humanitarian, but because he, he, he knows he's got to govern that country in some way in the future. And also, he doesn't want too many body bags flowing back into Russia to, to destabilize his regime. So I think 
for those two reasons, he 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 wasn't trying to. He was trying to, I think, be be restrained in his force. It's a ridiculous thing to say, really, because a, an invasion of other countries is anything but restrained. But in in terms of the the detailed conduct of the war, I think he was trying to hold back. And he may not now be able to be restrained. And this is where the real worry comes in, especially in those big cities. I, I wonder, of course the West has ruled out any form of no-fly zone, any form of direct military intervention. Um, if that makes it inevitable that then Russia will uh, eventually, if not in short order, uh, take the crucial parts of Ukraine, take control over the skies and the land, what, why, why is the West committing so much equipment to the Ukrainian army? Well, I think, I think one reason is that um, Putin must pay a price. He, if, even if he, if, he, if he wins this conflict, and I think, as I said, it's likely, if he wins this conflict, it must not be easy for him. He must pay a heavy price, which will result in destabilizing his regime to an extent. And the West should be doing everything else they can do, as well as trying to keep the Ukrainian army fighting. The West should do everything else it can do to, to bring him down. That must be the overwhelming strategic objective of NATO, to, to see an end to Putin one way or another. Uh, and, and for that, it means that all of our various uh, sanctions, diplomatic measures, isolation that we're doing results in turning Ru Russia into a pariah state for as long as Putin leads it. And, and of course, at that stage, we could turn and, and welcome Russia back into the civilized world. But until then, we need to work so hard at bringing him down and preventing further aggression by him in Eastern Europe. I feel frustratingly impotent that the United Kingdom, an economy much larger than that of Russia, even our armed forces uh, that have not had an, uh, much, as much money spent on them in the last decade as could have been the case. Even our armed forces budget is not that out of line with that of Russia. And yet we feel sort of impotent and the West feels sort of impotent in terms of our response, not able to go further because of this understandable threat and worry of nuclear conflict. This is clearly so frustrating for those in Ukraine. Is there nothing more that can be done militarily without risking that full scale nuclear conflict? Well, I think, and it isn't just the threat of nuclear conflict, that's a, you know, it's obviously part of it, but it's the threat of a, a, a conflict involving two states turning into a conflict that engulfs the whole of Europe, which it would almost certainly do if NATO got involved. I think the, the time for, for really serious NATO involvement and a, a capability to stop this conflict has passed. I think to have deployed NATO forces into Ukraine before Putin invaded would have deterred him from doing that because he doesn't want to out and out war with NATO any more than we want one with him. Mm. So, but of course, there was no political will for that. And certainly there's no political will for any military intervention now by NA any NATO countries. So it, it's simply not going to happen. What we can do is what we are doing. I hope we're doing anyway. We say we're doing it, which is to provide the maximum amount of lethal weapons, finance to help the war keep going, intelligence, surveillance, offensive cyber capabilities, all of these things everything really we can do short of direct involvement in the war, mm. we should be doing, and we should be doing uh, to as great an extent as we possibly can. And I'm glad to see that at last other European countries, as well as ourselves, have actually stepped up to the fight. A bit, bit late, but it needs to be done. Absolutely. Well, Colonel Richard Kemp, thank you for helping us talk through that military situation, depressing as it may be.